keeping first things first. My name is Alan Drake and the website is spiritofwisdommedia.com. Years ago, I was on a bus trip from Dallas, Texas, where I live, to Charlevoix, Michigan to play guitar. I had a lot of time to think on that trip and at one point I took time to inventory all the major areas of my life and arrange them in order of importance. I wrote an article to describe my conclusions in detail. That article, entitled Seven Priorities of Life, has since been translated into several languages and has become the most widely read article that I have ever written. To recap, these are my seven priorities of life. Number one is my relationship with God. Number two is my character, morality, and personal development. Number three, is my family. Number four, relationships with people outside of my family, such as my friends, acquaintances, leaders, government officials, and employers. Number five is my health. Number six, my work and other activities that give my life purpose. Number seven, finally, are my finances and possessions. All of these areas have importance, but I believe the areas at the top of the list are more important than those below them. I believe I can justify the placement of each priority with Scripture. For one example, when Moses chose to listen to his wife instead of obeying God's covenant, God came to kill him in Exodus chapter 4. To me, that seems to be a strong hint that we should put our dedication to God over our relationships with family even if it causes some conflicts with family members. There are other Bible passages that state it even more plainly. Years after I put that list together, I have struggled to keep the first things first. It seems that I have often chosen something less important to the neglect of what I firmly believe are more important priorities. And it happens so easily. Why is that? And how can I correct it? Looking at my own life, and I think it's true for all of us, I believe it is because we are driven to satisfy our own needs, and we mistakenly fall into the trap of thinking that our needs can be satisfied by something cheap and quick, and so we choose that shortcut and reject the higher values which are best for us and would provide deep, long-term fulfillment and satisfaction, but are not as easy and quick. It's the old story of Satan's temptations. Satan's temptations have common characteristics. He tempts us with things that promise only short-term pleasure and satisfaction, but like a sugar rush after eating sweets, the high doesn't last, and the crash on the other side of it leaves us feeling empty and worse than before. And it also contributes to long-term problems and at the same time plants in us a craving for more of the same. As Bill Gothard puts it, the wages of sin is more sin. But it sure felt good at the time, didn't it? Sometimes these poor choices carry long-term consequences and we will pay for them eternally. How was Jesus able to counteract Satan's temptations in Matthew chapter 4, and it's also in Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 4. When Adam and Eve fell so easily in Genesis chapter 3. If I can find the answer to that, I believe I will understand how to keep first things first in my life. Satan, who hates us, tempts us to reward ourselves now and pay dearly for it later and the price is never worth the pleasure. God lovingly urges us to do the opposite and pay the price now for rich eternal rewards later. Moses understood this. The Bible says he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt for he was looking ahead to his great reward. That's in Hebrews 11, verses 25 and 26. The Apostle Paul seemed to have a firm, grisp, firm grasp of this exchange when he said, 
I consider the sufferings of this present time, this present life, or not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. That's in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I think my problem is that I don't always believe that. If I really, really believed that, I would have a much better track record of choosing what is best in every area of my life. For example, what is keeping me from having the relationship with God that I want to have? Why do I make compromises that erode my character and integrity and keep me from being the kind of man that I would most admire? Why do I sometimes give more of my attention and my loyalty to passing acquaintances than I do to my own family? Why do I choose junk food over healthy food? Those are just a few examples. I think it's because I haven't really believed that the higher priority is best. I think it's because I haven't really, really believed God's promise in Philippians 4.19, which says, And my God will liberally supply, fill to the full, your every need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If I really, really believe that God will supply all of my needs so that I am completely satisfied, why would I ever choose something less? Why would I choose a cheap, quick shortcut that ends up just being an empty promise? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 6, that without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. In Jesus' experience in Matthew 4, also uh, described in Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 4, how was he able to turn down Satan's temptation for bread after having gone without food for 40 days? How was Jesus able to reject Satan's temptation to jump from the top of the temple and establish his identity as Son of God in a single act, once and for all, with an irrefutable demonstration of power and authority? And instead, choose to delay the glory and endure all of the opposition, the accusations, and persecutions that would follow during the years of his ministry. How was Jesus able to refuse Satan's temptation to easily gain possession of all the kingdoms of the world and choose death on the cross instead? The writer of Hebrews gives us the answer. He writes, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, and here it is, guys, who for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. That's in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. All of these questions I've had are answered in this passage. The writer of Hebrews gives us the key here to keeping first things first. Jesus was able to always choose what was best over short-term relief and pleasure because, number one, he firmly believed in his heart what his Father had promised him, and number two, his focus was unshakable, firmly set on what Father God had promised him. His eyes were fixed on the prize, and he never wavered from that focus. God has great things for you. In fact, if you believe that God's purpose for you is to have any less impact than changing the entire world for the better, your vision is too small. 
Think bigger. Take time to visualize a world-changing purpose that will impact future generations. When you can see that, you still won't have a complete picture of all that God has planned for you, but it's a start. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, that's in Ephesians 3, verse 20. If you are ready to experience a life filled with meaning and purpose and world-changing impact, ask God for, it, for that. Ask God for that. As James exhorts us, Ye have not because ye ask not. That's James 4, 2. Or, as it was recently restated to me, you don't have much because you don't ask for much. You know, this caught me completely by surprise because I thought I did have a lot. And I thought I was asking for a lot. I guess that shows how much I know. I've since determined to ask wildly for everything. And whatever is beyond everything, I'm asking for that too. Once you have a vision of living a life that makes a world-changing impact, you must make a serious commitment to keep your eyes firmly fixed on what is best, the ultimate, long-term, lasting rewards, the real prize, firmly believing that true fulfillment and satisfaction is found in keeping first things first and not giving in to short-term substitutes in any area of your life. It will require commitment and determination. But if you are willing to make the sacrifices necessary to live a life of true greatness, rising above the temptations and empty promises of short-term pleasures in order to reach your full potential in life, making a world-changing impact that reverberates throughout eternity, take time to pause and examine each area of your life. Have the courage to honestly evaluate each area of your life. The deeper you go in your evaluation, the greater will be the impact on your future. I'll give you a few questions to help you begin to take stock of your life. First of all, is your life everything that you want it to be? Is it everything that it could be? What would you want to be different in your life? Picture your perfect life if there were no limitations, nothing standing in the way of you accomplishing everything that you deeply desire for a life of true greatness. Does it match the life you are living? If not, what is it that is keeping you from living your best life? What is keeping you from living up to your full potential? What is keeping you from everything that you value most? Are you living in complete harmony with God? What changes do you need to make? There may be things in your life that are beyond your control, but what changes can you make in the areas that are within your control? Are you missing out on eternal rewards because of how you spend your time? Are you where you want to be with your goals and priorities in each area of your life? To recap again, number one, your relationship with God. There are innumerable benefits in putting our relationship with God above everything else in life. Everything in our lives stems from this. Number two, your character. Building and maintaining strong character, refusing to compromise integrity, pays off in so many ways and is the key to being not just called, but chosen for God's purposes, as Peter declares in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Number three, your family. Building and protecting strong family relationships refusing to betray those loyalties will pay off not only for us but also for those who observe our family relationships and will be the basis for significant impact 
from the messages that our lives communicate to others. Number four, your authorities, friends, and acquaintances, relationships outside of the family. Building and maintaining proper relationships with authorities and reaching out to meet the needs of those who come across your path will help you to fulfill the commands of Christ and will lead to deep fulfillment and satisfaction as you pursue the purposes for which you were created. Number five, your health. Choosing what is best for your health will provide you with the energy and ability to achieve your full potential. That's in Ecclesiastes 10.17. Number six, your work and other activities. Choosing to give your time to activities that help fulfill the purposes of your life instead of just having momentary pleasure will pay off in eternal rewards. Number seven, your finances and possessions. Wisely stewarding your finances and possessions will enable you to fulfill the purposes of your life, as well as providing the means for others to fulfill theirs, exchanging temporary wealth and possessions for eternal rewards. I hope that you will take time to seriously consider your goals and priorities in each area of your life and will be willing to take charge and take full responsibility for your life and your future and make the changes that are necessary to reach your full potential. This is not just a one-time evaluation. If it is really going to be effective in helping you to achieve your best life, it must become a lifestyle of consciously keeping first things first. May your belief in God's promises and your determination to keep first things first be absolutely unshakable. My name is Alan Drake and the website is spiritofwisdommedia.com.